All right, let's settle down. Art of Advent. Last episode. Open up your textbook. Ms. Sackenfeld, you were late again, all right? See me after class. Tom Coogan, I appreciate your comments on the discussion on Census at Bethlehem. You still have to wear a shirt, okay? Now, open up to Joyce McKeegan Walker. Honestly, if I hear O Canada one more time, I'm gonna lose it. Eric and Holly, this is not a CPR class. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the last and final episode of The Art of Advent. I'm still Jason Osting, and today we're gonna to take a look at the colors of Advent, what they've come to symbolize, and a few works of art that connect with those themes. We take color for granted today. The creation of synthetic pigments and industrial processes, color is no longer necessarily a marker of status. We can have practically any color we want at any time. But color certainly still has symbolic power. The traditional liturgical color for Advent has been purple. It symbolizes both royalty and repentance. Right, because royalty have historically been known for their penance. The pigment used in paintings and for dyeing fabrics purple for the past 3,000 years is known as Tyrian purple. Its origins as the color of royalty come from ancient Phoenicia, which means the land of purple. Tyrian purple refers to the city of Tyre, where starting somewhere around the 14th century BCE, this pigment was made in the outskirts of the city from the enzymes of the Murex sea snail. It quickly became the marker of royalty all around the ancient Near East, and centuries later an absolute obsession for the Romans, to the point where a man named Julius Pollux actually created a myth involving Hercules about his discovery. Basically, Hercules was walking along the beach with his dog, looking for a water nymph named Tyro. He was primarily interested in her personality and intellectual abilities. Classic Hercules. Always respecting women? Anyway, at some point, they found her, and Hercules was going on and on and on about how much he loved the latest article that she had written, when his dog came running up, and they noticed that the fur around his mouth was purple. Apparently, he had bitten a sea snail, and it stained his fur this amazing shade of purple. Tyro said that if Hercules wanted to read her dissertation, he was going to have to get her a purple dress. He tried to convince her not to succumb to the materialistic pressures of society and that true beauty was really found on the inside, but she insisted. So he went into the sea and gathered enough sea snails to make enough dye for a whole dress, When the process was born. Peter Paul Rubens, the illustrious 17th century Flemish painter, made an oil sketch of this somewhat random story, and his sketch was later turned into a full painting by Theodore van Tulden. The only thing he got wrong was the snail. He painted a smooth-shelled snail like a nautilus instead of the spiky-shelled murex. Yeah, Peter Paul Rubens, know your medium-sized predatory gastropods. While gathering sea snails may seem like a less-than-Herculean task, consider this. Producing one ounce of Tyrian purple dye required up to 250,000 snails. That would give you enough to dye one dress or toga completely purple. This obviously made it extremely expensive, and purple became all the rage for wealthy Romans. Most of the time, it was just the fringe of the garment that was dyed due to the expense. Julius Caesar was the first to wear an all-purple toga. Subsequent emperors made sumptuary laws, preventing certain people from wearing it. According to an edict from 301 CE, sometime in the rule of Diocletian, one pound of Tyrian purple dye cost 150,000 denarii, or three pounds of gold. It was worth it, though, because in addition to the color itself, which could range from a vibrant purple to a deep red to a pink even at times, depending on the other ingredients used, the stability of Tyrian purple set it apart from other dyes and pigments. While many dyes would fade over time, Tyrian purple resisted fading and could actually deepen in color. So if you were wealthy enough, and some sumptuary laws didn't prevent you from purchasing it, you could cloak yourself in a radiant purple and project your wealth and status to all who saw and smelled you coming. I'm sorry, did you say smelled? Oh yeah. There's a different kind of price to pay for wearing Tyrian purple. It stank. The color stuck around, but so did the smell of rotten seafood. There's a very good reason why the production vats discovered by archaeologists are all miles outside the nearest city. Thousands of snails would sit in these vats and rot for days until the dye was able to be extracted 
and mixed with a mordant, a substance that would help fix the dye to the fabric. To make matters worse, they often used urine as a mordant. Ew. But it stands as a testament to the power of purple that wealthy Romans, including the emperor himself, would wear clothing that smelled like expired shellfish just because it projected enormous wealth and power. You can see it in the mosaics of Emperor Justinian and Empress Theodora in the Church of San Vitale in Ravenna, Italy. The purple here isn't technically Tyrian purple since it's a mosaic, which is made up of small colored tiles, but it certainly represents it. Both monarchs are swathed in purple togas as they hold the bread and wine for the These mosaics face each other across the altar, but looking down from above in the apse is a mosaic of Christ returning in power in addition to his special cruciform halo and being seated on what appears to be the earth, he too is clothed in a purple toga, but his is completely purple, conferring upon him the highest honor. The church was consecrated in 548, and the presence of the emperor and empress, albeit in mosaic form, complete the long shift in Christianity from persecuted sect to the only legal religion in the empire. The power of the emperor is now associated with the power of Christ. But conversely, Christ's imagery is now firmly linked with royalty. You can see this in many other early Christian and Byzantine era mosaics as well. Purple was a clear way of depicting Christ as King of Kings. The rest of the interior of San Vitale is also covered in glittering mosaics. It's a dazzling, awe-inspiring interior and stands as one of the most opulent displays of religious art in the world. But it's hardly the only one. Over the next thousand years, churches across Western Europe would transform from the modest yet bejeweled buildings like San Vitale, to the massive fortresses of the Romanesque era, to the elegant stone and glass behemoths of the Gothic era, and to the unparalleled opulence of the Renaissance and Baroque. This extravagance eventually became a sticking point for some people. Calvinist rage rising. Who questioned if it was right to allocate so much money for such extravagance. Rising. And wondered who was actually being glorified. Right. Ooh, my muffins. These questions have persisted into the 21st century and have perpetuated a steady decline in the relationship between the church and the art world. There's a general thriftiness and practicality in many Protestants that just doesn't mesh with extravagant displays of opulence, even in the name of Jesus. It comes from a good place in general, given the option of funding a local food bank or buying a gram of Tyrian purple dye for just over $4,000, most churches would probably choose the food bank. Hold on, grams? What's a gram? This is America. Get out of here with your metric system. Give it to me a pounds, bro. Fine. A pound of Tyrian purple dye will cost you about $1.8 million. Gulp. What could a church do with that? Wow, they could pay a pastor for like a whole year. Fiscal responsibility certainly can be a virtue, but there is something that gets missed in this more ascetic mindset. It swings too close to the position of Judas after Mary anointed Christ's feet. Aghast at the act of wasting such an expensive item, a jar of ointment made of pure nard, which cost the equivalent of a year's wages, Judas looked to Jesus for some support in decrying such fiscal irresponsibility. Jesus, however, dismisses such concerns and rebukes Judas, saying, Why are you bothering her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. Contemporary artist Makoto Fujimura writes and speaks often about the extravagance of art and uses this moment from the life of Jesus to reframe how we approach works of opulence. In questioning whether a work of art is worth it, he says the question should not be why, but to whom. He says we are either glorifying ourselves or God. And the extravagance can only be justified if the worth of the object of adoration is greater than the cost of extravagance. The glory of the substance poured out can only reflect the glory of the one to whom it is being poured upon. And if the object of glory is not worthy, then the act would be foolish and wasteful. Going back to San Vitale, the apse mosaic shows Jesus holding out a martyr's wreath to St. Vitalius, after whom the church is named. But on the other side is Bishop Ecclesius, who began the building of San Vitale in 526 and is presenting the church to Jesus. The message is that the church itself is an offering to Christ for his glory. I don't think anybody would argue that Christ isn't worthy of this, 
but to be honest, it's a lot easier to appreciate works of extravagance that are hundreds of years old and you didn't have to pay for than to commission a new work of opulence. I'm not necessarily advocating a spending spree on art, just wondering what the 21st century version of pouring out pure nard perfume on Christ's feet would be. So as you light your purple candles on your advent wreath, or see purple in your churches, or wear purple, don't just think of Tyrian purple and its extravagance, its beauty or production methods, or smell. Think about the worthiness of the Son of God, whom we're all waiting for this Advent. Purple also symbolizes repentance during Advent, marking this season as an opportunity to acknowledge the individual and communal brokenness that necessitated the Incarnation in the first place. And the painting that came to mind when thinking about the idea of repentance is Rembrandt's Return of the Prodigal Son. Wait, wait, wait. I thought we were talking about purple. That is red, which is a Christmas color. We're not supposed to be talking about that. Respect Advent, bro. Okay, it's true. There is no purple in this painting. But Tyrian purple went AWOL in Western Europe after the Ottomans conquered Constantinople in 1453, necessitating a change in the Catholic Church's clothing from purple to red. Plus, depending on the timing and the other ingredients in the process, Tyrian purple could actually look kind of red. Although, according to Roman historian Pliny the Elder, this was the inferior version. You couldn't find a purple painting about repentance, could you? Well, no, not exactly. And I didn't think Francis Bacon's screaming popes fit the vibe exactly. Anyway, back to Rembrandt. Return of the Prodigal Son was one of the last paintings that he completed before his death in 1669. Referencing Christ's parable in the Gospel of Luke, it shows the reunion of the father and his younger son after the son demanded his inheritance, left home, squandered it, lived in squalor, and eventually returned home, hoping to at least work as a servant. Rembrandt used light and color to convey all the different emotions present in this scene. It's almost the exact opposite of a Bruegel painting. There's hardly any background at all, only dimly lit figures in a dark void. His technique is called tenebrism. It's an extreme chiaroscuro, Gesundheit. and consists of sharply illuminated figures against a dark background. It was developed by the Italian painter Caravaggio in the 1590s as a way to heighten the drama of a scene by eliminating all extraneous people, objects, or landscapes. The light coming from the left illuminates the father and son primarily, and the older brother secondarily. Rembrandt removed all distractions, everything that doesn't specifically point to this interaction between father and son. We can't really see the son's face. There aren't any tears or facial expressions that convey his remorse, but he kneels in front of his father, and his clothing reveals the state of poverty that he had been living in. His head is shaved, his clothes are filthy, one foot is bare, on the other is a shoe about to fall apart. The use of red points to the two emotional interactions in this painting. The father's vibrant red cloak frames his embrace of his son and projects that feeling of unconditional love and forgiveness as it hangs over and envelops the sun. It's the brightest part of the painting and draws the eye initially to the reciprocal actions of repentance and forgiveness. But then we're drawn to the other side of the painting, where the older brother stands, wrapped in a darker red and slightly removed from the light shining down on the reunion of his father and brother. His hands are crossed in front of him in contrast to his father's open embrace. He is not happy or relieved at the sight of his younger brother. He is simmering in anger and incredulity that his father would celebrate the return of this kid who had been so disrespectful and dishonorable when he had done all the right things all along. Rembrandt's ability to so deftly and expressively communicate these emotions came from a life that had its own ups and downs. As a young man, his career took off like a rocket. His early paintings display a more highly finished appearance and an uncanny treatment of light. He was a sensation in the Netherlands, and money and commissions came rolling in. You can get a sense of this from another prodigal son painting that Rembrandt did in 1635. This one depicts the son as he's squandering his inheritance in a tavern, drinking a tall beer and feasting on peacock pie. He used himself and his wife, Saskia, whom he had just married, as models. It's an oddly prophetic painting. Even though life was good and his star was rising, it didn't last. Personal tragedy and financial ruin would haunt the rest of his life, which ended mysteriously at 63. No illness was recorded, and he was laid to rest in a rented and unmarked grave. So what happened? 
Rembrandt himself had a spending problem. Even with a steady stream of income and commissions, he was barely breaking even, what with buying new houses and busts of Roman emperors and Japanese suits of armor and all kinds of other paintings, including Raphael's and Durer's. He eventually had to declare bankruptcy in 1656 and sell almost everything that he had. Until his death in 1669, he basically lived in poverty. All this, however, pales in comparison to the personal tragedy in his life. Rembrandt and Saskia's first three children all died within months of being born. The fourth, a son named Titus, lived. And then months later, in 1642, Saskia died. She was only 29. Losing three children, having a fourth that survives, but then losing his wife, must have been devastating. He had relationships with two women after Saskia's death. The first was Titus's nanny, Geertje Dirks. It didn't end well. She eventually ended up suing him for a breach of promise, meaning that he basically promised to marry her and then didn't. She won the lawsuit and was awarded alimony, which added to Rembrandt's financial woes. He then apparently tried to have her committed to an asylum or a prison after she pawned some of Saskia's jewelry. It was like an old episode of Jerry Springer. Two things prevented him from marrying her. Saskia had come from some money, and there was a trust fund set up for Titus. But the main stipulation in Saskia's will was that Rembrandt could never marry again. The other was that he had fallen in love with somebody else. Hendrik Stoffels was a maid in Rembrandt's house. They never married either, because of Saskia's will. But they did have a daughter together, named Cornelia, in 1654. They lived together through the financial difficulties of Rembrandt's bankruptcy, selling off his huge art collection, and moving to a much smaller home. Rembrandt's unique painting style was going out of fashion in Amsterdam. Commissions were drying up, and students stopped coming to study with him. Hendrik and Titus actually formed a new business to help protect Rembrandt from... Then in 1663, Hendrik died when an epidemic swept through Amsterdam. Five years later, another epidemic claimed the life of Titus, who was only 27. This brings us back to our painting. A fortune squandered, and the deaths of four children and two wives hang heavy over this scene. There's no record of anyone commissioning it. At this time, Rembrandt was mainly painting portraits to get by. So for him to return to this subject must have been a deeply personal decision. Carefree days when the world was at his fingertips are long gone, replaced with a life of poverty and mourning. There are so many questions that arise when looking at this painting. Is Rembrandt the prodigal? How much did he wish he could take back those years of spending sprees? Is he the father? How much did he long to embrace his son again, or his wife? But the older brother looms large on the other side. How much did he resent the world for turning its back on his art, believing he deserved better for his talents? Just as we tend to see ourselves in Christ's parables, we see ourselves in paintings. And without a doubt, we are all of these characters at some point in our lives. Repentance, forgiveness, stubbornness, indignation, impatience, and as always during Advent, waiting, waiting, waiting. The prodigal refused to wait and demanded his inheritance early. The father waited every day for his son to return. The older brother waited for what he thought he deserved. And we're still waiting this Advent. In the first episode, I asked how we were waiting. And the color purple reminds us to repent as we wait for the Messiah. But we repent because we have the hope of forgiveness. And that hope is embodied in the birth of Jesus. This has led some Christians to switch their Advent color from purple to blue, seeking to save repentance for Lent and give Advent its own liturgical focus of hope. Blue has its own history of opulence, seen as the color of the untouchable and unobtainable sky. Blue was associated with wealth and power for millennia. The greatest blue is ultramarine. Like Tyrian purple, it was worth more than gold and reserved for only the most worthy subjects. For centuries, only the church was wealthy enough to commission its use and reserved it almost exclusively for the Virgin Mary. That is, until someone figured out how to make it synthetically in the 19th century. <laughs> thanks a lot, science. No, actually, thank you. We saw Mary clad in blue in most of the Annunciation scenes in episode two. 
The hope of the world rested on Mary as she carried the Son of God. But we also saw how unlikely a choice Mary was for God to physically enter this world. Blue may be the color of hope, but hope is not always found where you might expect. Hope can be fragile, ephemeral, and difficult to grasp in times of trial. But depicting the intangible is something that Claude Monet tried to do for his entire career. He was never as interested in depicting specific people or objects as much as the light that reflected off of them. There are few things in this world as constantly confusing and confounding as light, and Monet's efforts to capture its effects eventually led him to overthrow many of painting's seemingly immutable laws. We can see this, and a lot of blue, in our last group of paintings, Monet's Water Lilies. He painted dozens of them, but we're going to focus on his later ones, which he started while World War I was raging just a few hundred miles away and worked on until his death in 1926. Monet's career is, in a lot of ways, the inverse of Rembrandt's. He and his fellow Impressionists were reviled at the beginning of their careers. They were unsophisticated hacks, the pariahs of the art world. But as time went on, their status rose, and by the end of his life, Monet was wealthy beyond his dreams and hailed as the greatest painter in French history. Probably did that wait one month thing that I came up with in the first episode. Which reminds me, with testimony like this, you really can't afford to wait another minute. That's $5,000 to 12... Monet had also recently lost his wife, and he actually gave up painting altogether until a friend, Georges Clemenceau, the French politician, convinced him that he needed to start up again. The project became an obsession for him, to the point where he couldn't quite part with them, even up to the day he died. There was something about these paintings that seemed to rescue him after losing his wife. It's like they anchored him somehow and gave him a reason to keep going. He had painted water lilies since 1897 on moderate-sized canvases, but by 1914, his vision for this project had grown much grander. The canvases grew bigger and bigger, so big, in fact, that in 1915, he had to build an entirely new, huge studio right next to his house in order to accommodate them. But instead of expanding the point of view of the scene to fit these new canvases, Monet plunged further into the lily pond, immersing the viewer in an increasingly abstract world of swirling blues, greens, and purples. He abandoned the traditional one-point perspective that had dominated Western painting for centuries, it's disorienting, but it serves as a reminder that as we all wait and hope for the Messiah this Advent, setting aside our own perspective is a necessary element of submitting to the will of God. Our ways are not God's ways. The way we see the world is not the way God sees the world. There wasn't a lot of hope in France during the four years World War I was raging on the Western Front, but the prospect of an epic, visionary project like the Water Lilies was actually one of the few things that gave French President Georges Clemenceau hope. He had to pull a lot of strings to ensure that Monet was able to get canvases and paints required for the project, as all those materials were rationed for the war effort. The French took painting very seriously. We've seen lilies in Annunciation paintings, symbolizing Mary's purity, but there's a bit of a twist with water lilies. They grow in stagnant water, and often the nastier the water, the more beautiful the flower. One may look at a stagnant pool of water and wonder that something so beautiful can come from it. But as we saw in Tanner's Annunciation, the hope of the gospel can be found in unexpected places. So immersing ourselves in the blue of Monet's water lilies, we're immersing ourselves in the unexpected beauty and the knowledge that even in the worst moments, whether you find yourself waiting in a world coming apart at the seams, beaten down by an oppressor, or at the bottom of the social hierarchy, Something as beautiful as hope can grow and point us to the good news that nothing is impossible with God, and in Christ, all things will be made new. And that's it for the Art of Advent. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It's been a lot of fun, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you all for watching, and Merry Advent. Merry Advent. Merry Christmas.